principal program manager for Java on Azure. Uh, what that means is I'm uh, by and large responsible for uh, most of the uh, Java work <clears throat> that goes on in the Azure platform in one way or the other. Uh, but of course, my passion really lies in, in Java E or Jakarta E. Uh, and in fact, that is uh, a big part of my day job as well. So a big part of my day job uh, is actually enabling uh, Jakarta EE developers on Azure. So that's what I'll be presenting on for the most part today. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the presentation and how it's going to go. Uh, but I'll also tell you this. Uh, everything that I'm showing you today, or, or, or I'm going to show you today, actually is mostly applicable to uh, Java de development in general on Azure. Uh, although my examples are going to be about Jakarta E, um, you can very easily apply these same sorts of uh, ideas to what have you, Spring, Micronaut, uh, whatever your uh, favorite Java platform is. Uh, the fundamentals from an Azure standpoint actually remains mostly the same. So what is this talk about? Uh, actually, for this talk, I do not have any slides whatsoever. Uh, uh, and in fact, that's deliberate, uh, because I don't think that this material lends itself well to suggest lecture. Uh, the best way of showing this material is actually by doing. Uh, and so I hopefully have something much more valuable uh, than uh, simply a slide deck. And what I have is this GitHub repository. And I'll talk, you, talk to you a little bit about what this GitHub repository is. Uh, but first thing is first, I'm going to uh, share this GitHub repository with you all. So let me see if I can figure out uh, where the chat window here is. Okay, I found the chat window, I think. So I'm going to uh, share this repository with everyone. Uh, so the idea, this repository actually represents not a talk, but actually a workshop. Um, so when I run this uh, workshop, it in general takes about uh, between six, six and eight hours uh, to do this workshop. <clears throat> So obviously, I don't, I don't have six to eight hours. I have about an hour. Uh, and I, I can uh, give you what, what I aim, aim to do is give you enough of an introduction of what this workshop is about so that you can go out and basically do this yourself. Uh, and in fact, this material is, is intended for that. It is intended for uh, people to take a look at by themselves uh, and do the, all, of the, all of the things <clears throat> by themselves as long as they have some idea of, of what's going on. So without further ado, let me jump into it and show you what is going on. Um, so uh, the first thing in, in doing this lab, uh, in doing the workshop, is actually showing you how does things work normally, right? So without the cloud involved, uh, what do, how do I do things on my own desktop? And that's, in general, how most developers start uh, on, on the cloud anyway. They don't just uh, start things on the cloud. They usually do something locally first uh, to do development and, and then talk about, OK, how do I move this to the cloud? So the first thing I'm going to do is just show you a very simple <coughs> Jakarta e CRUD application running on my own laptop. Uh, so the instructions for on how to do this is uh, included here, as you can see. So I've cheated, and this is how I'm going to do this uh, in uh, in just an hour or less uh, instead of six hours. Is I've I've already done some of the work ahead of time. So what do I need in on my laptop? Well, I need JDK. Uh, I need uh, I'm I'm choosing to use Payara. I could use any. Uh, Jakarta E8 application server, but I chose Payara. Payara is sort of my favorite. Uh, I'm going to use Eclipse IDE. You don't have to use Eclipse IDE. Ultimately, the project is just a Maven project. So you could use anything that I can understand Maven, whether that's Visual Studio Code, uh, NetBeans, uh, IntelliJ, whatever your preference is. Uh, I will use Docker. Uh, I don't have to use Docker, but I'll, I'll explain to you why I'm using Docker, even for local development. We will use Docker a little bit more heavily uh, towards the end of the presentation, and I'll show you why uh, that is the case a little bit later as well. Uh, and you need this code base. I have this code base cloned and downloaded on my own local desktop. So the first thing is, since this is a database-driven application, you need a database. Um, so the database I, I'm choosing to use uh, is Postgres. So I could have installed Postgres uh, locally on, on my laptop, but the reality is I don't use Postgres that much. Right? So there's no reason for me to install and uninstall uh, Postgres just to run a demo. Uh, so what I do use on a regular basis, though, in uh, in my job is Docker. Uh, especially if you do any kind of Kubernetes-based development, you will have Docker installed on your on your laptop. So one of the uh, very interesting uses of Docker is instead of trying to install stuff that you don't actually care about, you can simply run it on Docker. Right? So in fact, that is what I'm going to do. 
for my Postgres instance. Um, and I'm going to just uh, run Postgres within Docker on my local machine so that you know, I, don't, I don't need a local install whatsoever. Now, if you haven't seen Docker before, I will explain to you a little bit of the syntax. Uh, I don't plan to just, uh, just breeze over it, uh, just so you have an idea of what is going on if you've never seen Docker before. So this is a simple Docker command. It's a, probably the most common one. And what you're doing here is you're running a Docker image. IT uh, it says that this needs to be interactive. It can be in the background. RM means that uh, once I shut down this VM, I don't want any caching to, going on, to be going on. I don't need the underlying image to hang around and so on. I, it's totally ephemeral, right? So I, I just run it, get rid of it, I'm done with it. So uh, this is uh, dash dash name is I'm just giving it a name, which is for uh, uh, purposes of me being able, being able to identify this in case I did uh, I did want it to run it in the background. You need the, the Docker image run to have a, an identity, and that's what, why I'm giving it a name. Uh, the PG data is a bit more complicated, so I won't uh, explain the entire details of it. I'll just briefly describe it. So this is run, running a database. Um, Docker uh, is essentially ephemeral, which means when you doc, when you destroy and stop the Docker image, the Docker image goes away. So uh, the reality is, if you're running a database, you can't have that happen. You can simply um, run a, a, a Docker image on a database, destroy the, uh, stop running the image, and have your data go away. So what do you do? Uh, what you do is this. It's basically called uh, uh, virtual uh, directory mapping. Right, so basically, you're mounting a local file system, something that is in your file system, into the Docker image. And that way, if you, even if you shut down the Docker image, that uh, file system data still remains. And this is a pretty common technique if you're going to run anything that has carries any state in Docker. The dash p part uh, is also in interesting. So uh, dash p 5432, 5432, that's an important aspect of this command. And I'll explain to you why. So as you work with Docker, one of the things uh, that is going to be uh, the most difficult things to grasp is Docker networking. So when you run a Docker image, uh, it's actually not running on the same network uh, as your physical machine is running on. It actually creates its own sub-network within your own machine. Uh, and that network is actually by default closed. So you can't access any, any ports on that network unless you explicitly do something. So in this case, the dash p uh, command is actually saying, please open up this particular port, where, which Postgres runs on, inside of the Docker image, so I can, I myself can access it even from my local machine. And finally, the last argument is the most important, which is the name of the image that I'm going to be running. In this case, I'm, I'm running Postgres. Uh, and it's basically referring to uh, a Postgres image, the latest post Postgres image uh, that is published on Docker Hub. So let's uh, go ahead and run this. Uh, so everything is just running very quickly. The reason is I've done this before. So basically, Postgres is already cached uh, somewhere inside of my Docker cache on my own machine. Uh, the database is up and running. It is running on port 5432, as you can see. So now I'll cheat a little bit more and do a look ahead. So I, uh, you will need to <clears throat> do some setup of Pyara uh, inside, of, inside of the IDE. You'll need to do an installation of the Postgres uh, driver right, in order for to be able to access the database. And you'll need to set up set up the application itself. And all of those steps are outlined here. Uh, again, I'm, I'm in the in the interest of time, I've already done this ahead of time. So as you can see, uh, this PyR server, server uh, installed on the IDE, there is the application. Uh, and I'm just going to do a simple clean and build of the application uh, just to make sure nothing gets, me gets messed up, so maven clean. <clears throat> yeah, that's all done. Uh, and uh, and then I'm going to just do a uh, Maven install or uh, Maven package more more precisely. It doesn't have an option in uh, in uh, Eclipse. I'm just going to do Maven install. All right. So the Maven install is done. I've built my war file and now I can run it. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and say right click and run as run on server, and this would hopefully start up Pyara. Sometimes this takes a little bit of time because I have antivirus software running on my machine. Uh, unfortunately, this is a micro, This has to be a Microsoft-approved machine, and all Microsoft-approved machines need to have a, a, a virus scanning software installed on it. So this will take a little bit, uh, but hopefully not too much long. Uh, 
So that's about... Usually this Pyra is pretty fast. If you don't have a virus scanner running, um, it should do a cool start of you know just a few seconds, no, not much more than that. Okay, good. Uh, there's my application. Uh, I'm gonna just put it up in a real browser. I never use the built-in uh, built browser uh, with the IDE, really. It's uh, not really all that good. Perdimos a Reza. No lo veo en la lista. Sí, eh, parece que se perdió su conexión. Eh, voy a escribirle a Skype. O Peter mejor. Ahí viene. Hello, Reza, we meet you. Uh, your microphone is, is off. Hey, guys, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I didn't know when when I lost my connect when I lost my connection. Were you guys able to see me running the uh, application on the browser? Yes, yes. You were okay. All right. So you've seen uh, you've seen basically now the local setup. Uh, so we'll move on from the local setup and uh, uh, begin to take a look at how to run this on the cloud. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about that. So running the application locally is is not is not very hard to do. It's, it's, a, it's a simple thing um, to do, and hopefully uh, something that you guys are pretty familiar with. Uh, it's a little bit more different uh, when you begin to talk about the cloud. So uh, whatever cloud there may be, uh, and in fact, this is very, very true of uh, Azure, uh, there's different things, that, there's different ways you can um, go on to the cloud. So I'll explain to you the four different uh, main options in Azure. Uh, and I'll talk about which of these that I'll show you and, and why. So the first option is IaaS, or virtual machines. So uh, this particular option is something that I'm going to show you. Um, the re this is actually very, very similar to uh, how you would work potentially in your own data center. So this is literally just getting a, a machine on somebody else's computer. In this case, uh, the, the machine happens to be running on Azure. But more or less, uh, the rest of the experience in terms of application development is very, very similar, right? It's 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 a very similar uh, way of doing things, and that's why I'll show you how this looks like. So we'll take this same uh, application that was running locally and actually run it uh, using virtual machines, and I'll show you just why it's not a very big deal at all. The second option is PaaS or Platform as a Service. So this is almost the opposite of what IaaS is. Uh, so in IaaS, as you'll see, you will be doing all of the installations just like you would do uh, yourself 
uh, in a uh, in in a sort of a uh, a, uh, a local environment. With Paz, you do almost the exact opposite in that everything is actually a wizard, right? So uh, everything is done for you. Everything is handled automatically. You just do uh, a few clicks, and then all of your entire runtime environment is already set up for you. So that's the Paz option. I won't show you the Paz option. I do encourage you to take a look at it uh, yourself. Uh, it also uses Payara, and uh, I, th I think it's, it's relatively interesting. So a lot of you have heard of Kubernetes, of course. Uh, by this point. So a uh, lot, lot of people say that Kubernetes, Kubernetes is too complicated for them. They don't need Kubernetes, uh, but they do like Docker. So in order to uh, satisfy these sorts of folks, uh, there is an option in Azure called uh, uh, Azure Container uh, Instances, or ACI. And what the ACI basically allows you to do is that it allows you to use Docker and uh, put your Docker image uh, on to, onto Azure without necessarily using everything that you would need with uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and that's a simple way of, of, of using containerizing your application. So I won't show you this option either, but uh, you should take a look at this option. It's a, it's a reasonably interesting option. But the last option that I will show you is uh, uh, how to deploy the same application using Kubernetes on, on Azure. Uh, and the reason I'm going to show you this example is uh, when we talk to customers, this is actually the most popular option. Uh, when you talk to uh, when you talk to uh, most Java or Java E developers, this is the path that they really want to go on. Uh, but they're very afraid that this Kubernetes thing is too complicated, right? It's it's a kind of a scary beast. But the reality is that's not the case. Uh, Kubernetes actually is a is a very very simple uh, uh, thing, especially if you're used to doing things the IaaS way, and you do everything by hand, all of your infrastructure set up by hand, Kubernetes actually, by comparison, is not that complicated. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show you uh, with uh, Java EE, is that Kubernetes is not as scary as you think. So for my example, I to already told you, I'm using Jakarta 8, Payara, and, and Postgres, but you can use any, just about anything you want. So let's get started with the virtual machines option and see how that looks like. All right. so. Uh, again, you'll need to do a little bit of setup. I've already done the setup beforehand, so we can skip forward. Uh, so just like on, on locally, you need a database. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'm again going to use uh, Postgres PaaS uh, on Azure. So I've already set that up. There's no reason to take uh, take up time in the presentation to do that. To do that, so this is the Azure portal. If you've never seen it before, so when you create an Azure account, you will get a portal just like this. Uh, if you go to the home directory and then you go to uh, resource groups, this will tell you all of the groups of resources that we have. And the one I'm using is called Jakarta e Cafe Group Reza. And again, all these instructions are, are on GitHub on how do you do that. So in here, I have a uh, Azure database for Postgres SQL Server running already. So if I click on this, you'll see that it's a Postgres instance, Azure database for Postgres Server. Uh, and it's just up and running for me. I've, I already have it all set up. Uh, I just followed these steps that I've outlined here in, in uh, the GitHub repo. Then we're actually going to create the machine. We're, we're going to uh, begin to uh, create the thing that will allow us to run this application uh, on uh, Azure. So let's go ahead and do that, and we'll do that together. So the first thing is uh, actually going and creating this virtual machine, which is pre pretty easy to do. So you just hit Create Resource, uh, and then what we're wanting to do is a virtual machine. So I'm going to select the Compute option. And then you'll see I have many different options. Uh, I have Windows, I have uh, I have Kubernetes, I have all these other options. Uh, but what I'm going to choose is uh, basically Ubuntu Server, the latest version, latest LTS version of Ubuntu Server for my demo. So let me go ahead and um, pick that, and it'll ask me some options. Okay, so what what do you where do you want this created? And I want it created in the same resource group that I was working on before, so Jakarta Cafe Group Reza. I'm going to give it a name. Uh, so the name I'm going to give it is very, very simple. And I'm just going to copy this from my GitHub repo. Uh, it's just going to be Jakarta E Cafe Server. So I'll copy and paste this name here. All right. Uh, I'm going to create an, in the ECS region. region. This uh, defaults are all fine. This is the size of the machine I want. That's also fine. Um, so when you create a virtual uh, server on Azure, it's just sitting on Azure. 
right? So uh, that's not very useful. In order for it to be useful, you need to be able to access it from your local machine. So how do you do that? Well, you typically do that through SSH. So in a production environment, uh, you would want to use a SSH public key. Uh, in this case, since we're just doing a demo, we're just going to do something simple. We're just going to use a password instead. Uh, so the password also is here. So I'm just going to take uh, use Payara as, as the username. And I'm also going to use a password setting. All right. Uh, so by default, all of the ports are shut down on a VM. So uh, you will need to specify what ports you want to open. Uh, and in this case, we actually want all of the ports open because we're going to be running Pyara uh, ultimately on this machine. So we want port 80, the port HTTPS, and port SSH open. And again, this is all uh, outlined uh, in, in the instructions. So we'll pick all of these ports. Uh, and basically, we're good to go at this point. We can uh, let me double check with the instructions. Uh, but yes, we're, we're all set to go. We can now just hit uh, review and create. And it will validate that all the settings that I uh, provided is uh, is valid and it is passed. Uh, and I'm going to hit the create button. Now, I'll tell you why I did uh, the setup of the database ahead of time. So the most time consuming thing you'll do on, on the uh, on on the cloud is waiting for deployments, waiting for resources to be created. Right, So it's going to take a little bit of time for this VM to be set up, right? probably about uh, between 5 and 10 minutes. Uh, that's nothing compared to uh, what it would take if you were to do this on your own local data center. right? You'll probably spend days doing this. But it does take a little bit of time to do this. It's not, not instantaneous. Uh, as you can see, there's some resources being created for us as we speak. Uh, so uh, this is why in a demo, in a customer, especially with customers, you don't want to be doing this in real time. Right? So it's it's better to do a lot of these things ahead of time. But we will still let uh, let this be created. Right? So it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to do that. And in the meanwhile, we're going to uh, make use of this time by giving you a look ahead uh, of what it is that that will be that we'll be looking at uh, in a second. So once this virtual machine is created, uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to SSH into this box right, uh, to make it useful. Uh, and at that point in time, it's really nothing much more than any other machine. right? So it's, it's as, like for, from a development standpoint, you, you would hardly care. right? It, this could be an SSH machine uh, set up in your own data center, and it's just about the same experience from then on. But then what you have is you have the responsibility to actually set up this machine. Right, so you need to do all of the things that is necessary to, to do that to do those steps. So the first thing you're going to do is do uh, an apt get update. And why is that? The reason is, well, uh, when you create these uh, images from uh, the marketplace, it'll always be some a little bit late, right? So it'll be uh, maybe a few months old and so on. So you won't have the latest thing. So uh, the first thing you really need to do once you get a virtual machine is make sure it's up to date. So you just need to up to date up, up to date all of the package information by issuing a apt get update. Uh, then you need Java, right? Because this is Java application. Uh, Ubuntu does not come with uh, Java installed by default, so you need to install Java. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to be installing Maven uh, on the machine itself. Typically, you won't need to do this. So typically, uh, when you're doing this in a production environment, you will have some other CI/CD solution that will deploy that will build the, your application and deploy it on, onto the server. But since this is a demo, basically, we'll be doing the build on this machine itself. So we need Maven. Uh, downloading Pyara is super simple. And downloading and creating Pyara is super simple. Oh, actually, it's done. Uh, it's probably because it's Saturday, <laughs> and there is nobody else uh, accessing <laughs> this machine right now. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's done quicker than, than I thought. So let's let's go ahead and uh, and uh, and actually do the steps. So we'll, let, we'll uh, so we'll first thing is we'll uh, SSH into into this box. So let's do that. So I'll open up my terminal. All right, and I'll get the public IP which is available on the Azure portal. There's a public IP address right there. I'm going to just copy this uh, public IP address. All right, and yes, okay, now I need to put in my password. 
this is some reason I always mess this up. Uh, so now we're ready to go. We're yeah, we're in our physical machine. Uh, we're all we're all set. I'm just going to do a PWD. As you can see, I'm in slash home Pyara, uh, and now we need to uh, just go through the steps and uh, do the install of our, of our application. So first thing is we're going to do the sudo apt get update. And this will take a little bit. Uh, it depends on how old this uh, virtual machine usually is. I usually take the latest one whenever I create this, but there's still some lag. There's always some things uh, that are a little bit behind. So it takes a little bit to do, but actually, in this case, it was pretty fast. I uh, didn't need to wait too much. Uh, then I'm going to install the JDK. So let me do that. Yes. And I'm installing JDK 8 in this case. You can install whatever JDK you want. Uh, in, in, in this case, this is a Jakarta E8 application. Uh, the supported version is still uh, Java SE8. So Java SE8 is, is, is fine for me. Uh, so the other thing that while this is going on, I should tell you is uh, for this particular demo, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, now, in real life, believe it or not, when you're using Azure Virtual Machines, you wouldn't do this kind of thing uh, because Azure comes with uh, another capability called ARM templates, and it's basically a JSON file. Uh, and all of the things that I'm doing manually, you can do through scripting. Uh, uh, ARM templates. So you put in all of all of the things that you need in inside of your ARM template, uh, and instead of typing manually, you just issue that ARM template, and it takes care of all of these details for you uh, in a repeatable way. So you could uh, do the exact same installation across multiple machines very very easily. Uh, but again, I wanted to just show you that this is um, the cloud is not scary. Right, so the cloud is not complicated, uh, especially if you're using virtual machines. It's no different than than uh, just somebody giving you a machine and saying, "Hey, go go for it." It's just that this machine happens to be running on on Azure. That's all. Okay, it's almost done. Actually, it's uh, sixty-two percent is not. Uh, really uh, very fair. It's actually going to go faster once all the uh, downloading is done. All right, so now I have Java installed. Uh, next step is we're going to install Maven. So a Maven install is really, really quick because a Maven is not very large. Okay, and again, normally we wouldn't be doing this. Uh, normally, this would be in a CI/CD server, uh, but in this case, we're going to do the local, uh, the the build locally on this machine, um, just to keep things keep things simple for the day. Okay, so once this is done, uh, the next step for us is going to be downloading Pyra itself. Uh, downloading and installing Pyra is very very simple. You just download the uh, Pyra zip. Uh, and you unzip it, and then you're ready to go. All the, all the installation is done. So you couldn't get uh, any more easier than that. OK. So we'll just do that. Uh, download Payara. OK. Uh, you'll also need to install unzip. Yeah, so we need to unzip this this file. So in order to do that, we we'll, we're going to install unzip on this machine. Uh, for some reason, unzip is not uh, installed by default in Ubuntu, which is surprising. OK, so that's done. Uh, next, we're going to unzip uh, the Pyara zip file. So, and that will complete our installation of Pyara. Right, now, if I do a list directory listing, there's Pyara sitting right there. We can actually remove the Pyara uh, zip file. There's no need for it anymore. So we just had the Pyara 5 installation at this point. Uh, we can now we're going to get the application itself, right from my from my GitHub account in this case. So uh, another wget command. <clears throat> okay. 
Great. And that's all done as well. Um, now we're going to unzip this, uh, unzip our application as well. Same thing as uh, we did for, for Payara. Unzip. And we'll remove this uh, file as well. <clears throat> all right. Uh, and now we have our uh, setup basically done. All right. So now we just need to uh, hook things together, and we're we're going to be all set to go. So the first thing we need to do is uh, basically install uh, the the server itself. Right. So we're we're going to uh, begin to do that next. So in order to do this, we're going to go. Uh, actually, is this quite correct? Okay, so uh, the next thing we need to do is is, is basically uh, build uh, the application itself. Right, so uh, let's let's do that. We're going to go into the, where we in installed our application. Okay, we're going to go actually go into the IS directory. We're going to the Jakarta e Cafe. All right, and there's there's my um, uh, application. There's my palm XML file and source uh, directory. So I'm going to just do a Maven uh, Maven package to build a jar file to build my WAR file. Ah, sorry. And then to NPM. All right, so that's now uh, basically done. All right, so I have I have my WAR file. I'm going to bump back up to my home directory. All right now, uh, I'm ready to install this uh, application into my uh, my uh, my Pyara installation. But before I can do that, I need to do a, a little bit of a few setup steps. Now, because I'm going to be running everything on port eighty. Uh, I need actually super user access in order to be able to do that. So uh, before I execute the rest of the steps, I need to do a sudo su uh, to make sure I have super user access. So I'm going to uh, do a sudo, sudo su right now, and that will put, basically put me into the uh, into the uh, same home directory as before, except uh, for being super user. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start the domain. Uh, so by default, Pyara starts on port 8080. Uh, and that's not going to work because we are listening. Uh, we only open port 80 uh, in, in the public virtual machine, if you remember. So we're going to need to do a little bit of setup changes in order to run uh, on port 80 instead of port 8080. And in order to do that, and even actually even in order to do the deployment, I need to start the domain. So I'm going to start Payara. So Pyra is now up and running, but it's running on port 8080. So I won't be able to access it. So the next thing I need to do is change that, right? So and make Pyra run on port 80 instead. So this long command, which you can take a look at later, that's basically what this command is doing. It, it is making sure that uh, uh, we are run we are running the application on port 80 instead of port 8080. So let's do that next. And once this uh, once this command is done, basically I have uh, I, I'm I'm going to be able to access Pyara right away on that machine, and I'll show you. So let's go back to the uh, to this, and let's copy the public IP address, uh, and let's enter the public IP address. And as you can see, there's Pyara up and running. I don't have the application set up quite yet, so we're going to do that next. But basically, we're now running Pyara on the cloud, right? And it, hopefully, it wasn't a very uh, difficult or uh, very complex experience. So next thing we need to do is install the library using the add library as admin command, uh, because uh, what we have here is uh, basically we, we need access to the database. In order to do that, we need we need the driver. Uh, and, you, and that's how uh, the add library command is how you uh, add a driver to uh, Pyara. So let's execute this command. OK, that's done. Uh, or uh, we are now ready to access the database, and the final step is just to deploy the WAR file. Right, so we're we're going to use the AS admin deploy command to do that. So let's go ahead and execute that command. All 
Uh, and normally this takes just a few seconds, no much, no, not much more than that, same as uh, you would uh, running locally. So that's now done. Now we can access the application. Right, so let's go ahead and uh, enter that IP address once again. Oh, uh, lost it. Let's let's take it from here. All right, that's the IP address, and we're going to access the application on the cloud now. All right, and there's the application running on the cloud. Uh, I had done, the, so because I had the database up and running before, I had a copy of just one bit of data in here. Let's an add another one. <coughs> okay, and there you have it. Uh, the application is now basically running on the cloud. So once this is done, I'm going to actually exit out of uh, the shell. And I'm back on my command line. And so uh, we're, we're all done with, with, with this particular demo. Hopefully, you saw just how easy easy it is uh, to do uh, cloud-based deployments using virtual machines. So next, uh, let's move on and uh, begin to take a look at uh, how to do this in Kubernetes instead. Right. So we're going to skip over the, pa the PaaS and, and Docker options. Uh, we don't really need to. Uh, take a look at those. I, I welcome uh, you to take a look at this yourself. Right? But let's move on, on to the Kubernetes portion of the demo and see how that looks like. Okay. So uh, the steps are going to be much the same. You still will need a database. Um, so we already have the database created, so we don't have to worry about that. The database creation portion is, is done. Uh, you will also need to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Right? So you'll actually need to uh, create the, Kuber the environment, the Kubernetes environment, uh, or the runtime that you will deploy against. So this actually takes about a good 20, 25 minutes to create as well. Same, same thing as creating a VM. So I wanted to save us time instead of uh, using all that time in, in the demo to do the deployment. I just went ahead and created uh, a Kubernetes uh, instance ahead of time. Right? So there is uh, Jakarta e Cafe cluster. If you click on that, you'll see that it is uh, Azure Kubernetes service. It is up and running. Uh, there is a few things uh, up and running already. I'll show you the uh, metrics, for example. Okay. And as you can see, there is, uh, sorry, the insights, for example. Uh, and you'll see there's some, there's some things going on. Right? So there's no CPU activity right at this moment. Uh, there is no uh, me node memory count. And uh, there is uh, not many, there's no active pods at this point. Right? So everything is just uh, uh, basically sedentary. There's really nothing nothing going on. We're going to begin to do things with this, uh, with this cluster. Though. So the first thing you need to do in order to get uh, set up with Kubernetes is use this use a tool called kube control. And kube control is a command line application. Um, basically, using uh, uh, kube control, it's a, it's a linkage between your local machine and the Kubernetes cluster uh, running remotely. Right, so in order to uh, make that uh, hookup happen, all you really need to do is issue one command call, called azaks get credentials. Right, so I've already executed this command. So as a result of executing this command, I can just actually use kube control right now. So I'll show you some other uh, things that are going on on the cluster. So let's say get services. And as you can see, nothing really. No, there's no other services running on the cluster except for the Kubernetes engine itself. Okay, so uh, we will create more services as we go along, but right now there's not any. Uh, let's take a look at how many nodes there are. So nodes are basically a pool of machines. So I have uh, three uh, agent pools running. So I could uh, deploy uh, machines from these pools. Let's see how many pods I have. So I have no pods whatsoever. Right, so I have not actually deployed any running machines on this yet, and I've only had the Kubernetes service up and running. So, but uh, the main point I want to make is we are now connected, right? So we are connected to uh, the Kubernetes cluster, and we're ready to go. We're ready to ready to do deployments on the on the Kubernetes cluster without any issues. So, first thing we're going to need to do in order to do any of this is uh, have a WAR file to deploy. Right. So before you can do any, anything else, you, you still need that basic deployment artifact. So let's go ahead and create that one. Uh, let me first see where I am. Yeah. Okay. And 
I'm going into the directory. I'm going to go into the Kubernetes directory. Uh, and in this Kubernetes directory, I have another copy of the Jakarta e Cafe application. So I'm going to just go in there real quick. Uh, as you can see, there's a POM file here, and I'm just going to do a maven command. And now I have my war file. It's a slightly different war file, but basically the same idea as before. Uh, I'm going to now bump back one directory up, and you'll see this Docker file uh, thing sitting over here. And we'll talk about the we'll talk about the Docker file in, in a second if you haven't seen it before. So the next thing we need to do uh, in order to use Kubernetes is we need to take this war file and we need to put it in a in, in its Docker image. And what exactly is a Docker image? So a Docker image is something very similar to uh, the VM uh, that we created. So it's a, it's a literally a definition of a virtual machine. It's not a virtual machine itself. You're saying, how should this virtual machine actually look like? So let me uh, go ahead and execute this step, and I'll explain what I'm doing uh, as, as I'm doing it. So let's uh, go to the command line, and I'm going to uh, put this. Sorry, I, for, it looks like I didn't do an actual copy. There we go, copy. Uh, and I should be able to paste this command now. OK. Uh, and I'm going to explain the syntax of this uh, of this command in a second. Let me just make a quick modification, and, I'll, and then I'll explain to you what I'm doing. All right. So this is the uh, second most co uh, Docker uh, uh, command that you'll make, which is Docker build, which, which is saying, please build an image. Okay, uh, And dash T is the name of the image. So in this case, the name must contain, uh, must match put this image. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. But my repository name is Reza Raman uh, on, on GitHub, and then the name of the image that I want to provide is Jakarta EE Cafe. And then I'm also giving it a tag or a version. Uh, in this case, I'm calling it V1. Uh, and the last dot here uh, basically is saying, look in the current directory for the Docker file uh, and execute the Docker file to create this image. So let's uh, run this guy and see what happens. All right, so the image is, is built, as you can see from the output, there's uh, four steps to it. Steps one, two, three, four. Okay, each of these are actually a separate layer uh, in in terms of Docker. So now let's take a look at how this Docker file actually looks like. So let's do that in the repository itself. Easiest easiest way to look at things. So this is my actual Docker image, and let me uh, increase the font a little bit so you guys can can see it. Okay, so. Um, in, in Docker, it, you won't start everything from scratch. Right? So you typically will start from a base image. And in this case, the base image I'm choosing to use is Payara full. So this is the equivalent of everything else that I had done in my in my uh, VM setup. Remember, installing Java, installing, doing APT update, and all of that stuff. All of that stuff is basically taken care of. Typically, it will, it has start, it's starting with a Linux kernel like CentOS. Uh, and then the JVM and Pyra server. So that's all done in the from clause. Uh, then all I really need to do is copy the war file that I need into the deployment directory. And, and uh, bas basically, uh, the typical way this is done is that there is an environment variable that, that has also been defined as part of the base image. In this case, the deploy directory. So I just need to copy the war file into the deploy directory. Uh, I will uh, then be able to copy over the Postgres jar file, just like I did an add library uh, in, in the VM setup. I'm going to also execute the add library command uh, this way, and it's all documented in the in the uh, Pyara uh, Docker image on how to do this. And that's all you need. Right? Just need to copy over the war file, just need to copy over the Postgres jar file, and you're ready to go. Right? So this, this doc when this executes, you'll wind up with the same result uh, as we saw uh, as a result of me going through all of those steps, manual steps before for, for setting up the VM. So next step is, uh, once we've done that, we're going to actually uh, push this Docker image uh, in, into my Docker repository. And I'll explain why I'm doing that in a second. So let me first do it. Uh, and as I'm doing it, I'll explain what this step, step is accomplishing. So Docker push. As a on. Okay. All 
right? And the Docker push should be done relatively quickly, I hope. Yeah, so that's done. So now let's talk about why I did this. Uh, so remember that uh, you just built, or I just built, this Docker image on my local machine, right? So the Docker image is sitting on my local machine. Whereas really where I want it deployed is on Azure, right? So in order for Azure to be able to access this, I need to put it someplace where where Docker, where uh, uh, where Azure has access. So in this case, um, that's why you need to do the push. The, what the push is actually doing is pushing this Docker image into somewhere in the public domain. So you could push it on on Docker Hub, which is what I what I just did actually, or you can push it in a private repository. So Azure has this capability of creating private repositories. You could install this image on a private repository as well. But in fact, what I just did is just upload the image onto my my public Docker Hub account. So let me, let's go to my public Docker Hub account and see what's in there. So if you look. Um, there's there's the image that I just pushed. It's called Reza Raman, my repository name, Jakarta e Cafe, which is the name I gave it. Uh, and it says uploaded just a minute ago, which is just about right now. Uh, so if you look here and you look in the tags, I have a V1 tag. Right? So this was just up to, up, updated just now, right? updated a minute ago. So now I'm all ready to go. Right? This this uh, I can access this machine from uh, AKS and be able to actually create machines from it. So let's do that next. So in order to do that, uh, you issue this command. And I'll explain what the syntax of this command is and what it actually does. This is cube control create. OK. So what cube control create does, uh, actually, before I issue that command, let me just check one thing. Yep, yeah, I'm in the right place. OK. So uh, what this uh, cube control create command does is that it creates resources on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and typically, the resources are defined in deployment files. And uh, basically, uh, Kubernetes uses YAML as, as, as uh, the deployment file format. And you in that YAML file, you describe what do you want to create? What, what are the resources that you are trying to deploy? Uh, think of it as sort of a description of your data center of your virtual data center. That's in, that's what's in the YAML file. So I'm going to hit Create on it. So it's created, uh, but don't be fooled. It's not actually done. OK, I'll explain to you in a second why it's not done yet. But while uh, that is going on, let me show you the contents of the YAML file. All right. So the contents in, in the YAML file is that this is describing a deployment. Uh, I'm creating a resource called Java EE Cafe. That's what it's going to be named as. Uh, you'll see it when I when I do it uh, when I just do a description of the services and the and the pods. Uh, but the most important thing is that I'm creating two copies of the image now. So I'm taking the Docker image file that that uh, I created and I'm creating two copies of it. So I'm creating two machines. Uh, and basically, this is a specification of where the image is supposed to be coming from. Uh, if you look uh, in my local uh, YAML file, I've actually replaced this Docker Hub ID with Reza Raman. So basically, the image is coming from my Docker Hub account, Okay, this particular image. Uh, and finally, uh, the same as in Docker, in Kubernetes, everything is not open by default. Everything is by default closed. So even if I created two, two uh, machines, I won't be able to access those machines from the outside. Uh, in order for me to be able to access those machines, I need to create a type of service. Okay, a service. When you define a service, that is what is going to be able to open up uh, the access to those machines. So in this case, I need to. I'm creating a service, as you can see here, uh, and the type of service is a load balancer. So what I'm actually wanting to do is say that take my Java e, Jakarta e Cafe uh, instances, the two machines with that tag, and apply a load balancer in front of it. And you'll also notice that there's some port mapping going on. So as I mentioned to you before, by default, uh, these Docker images will run on port 8080. So, but I want port 80 to be accessible uh, from Kubernetes because that's that's in a normal production environment, that's what you would want to do. So I'm doing that port mapping within the, the load balancer itself. So now let's go to check to see if uh, my deployment actually succeeded. And the way I do that, is I check to see if the load balancer was deployed. 
right? So this is the command to do that. All right, and it's actually deployed. So the way I know this is because this uh, external IP value is there. So I, I'm able to access this uh, machine through these, these uh, this cluster through these uh, this IP address. And in fact, let me do uh, cube control services. In this case, notice before uh, there was only the Kubernetes uh, service itself. Now there is a load balancer. The load balancer's name is Jakarta E Cafe. Uh, and you're able to see that it, it has an external IP. Now if we do, uh, let's say, pods, you'll see that there's two pods. And they're both tagged with the, with the Jakarta E Cafe tag. And they're both uh, are in status running. So I have two uh, machines up and running and ready to go. If I did nodes, uh, they will still see see that there are three no there are three nodes up and ready to go. Okay, so now uh, let's go back and try to access this application. The Pyra is up and running. I hit one of the Pyra instances. And the application is also up and running. So let's uh, add one more. Uh, one more thing to it, and there we have it. So this is running on uh, AKS right at this moment. So let's uh, do a few more things here. We'll do uh, uh, another delete and another delete, and let's do another create. Okay, and let's uh, do another one. And let's access the application once again. OK, so I did a little bit of activity. Now let's, uh, we'll, we'll see what, the, what happens with this activity in a second. So uh, the other thing you should be aware, you should know is uh, the one of the nice things you get with Kubernetes is that there's a whole bunch of logging and monitoring going on. Right? So if you look at my activity log, you'll be able to see what are all the different things that I did uh, with this. Uh, there's access control, there's tags. OK, so there's a variety of inference. There's node pools. Okay, so you'll see that I have, I have a node pool count of three. I could go in here, and I could increase the node pool. Uh, I could uh, set up to be auto scale By default, it's manual. So there's a whole bunch of capabilities that come uh, with, uh, with Kubernetes uh, that's not Kubernetes uh, standard, but uh, it's all available through the, uh, the Cloud Providers Console, in this case, uh, the Azure Console. But so let's take a look at the monitoring information and see what we see in this case. So let's update it. Uh, OK. So you'll see a little bit of a spike, tiny little bit of a spike in the, in the, in the memory utilization, uh, not yet in the CPU utilization. And you'll see uh, activity pod count has increased. Right. So basically, I've increased the number, number of pods that I'm using. OK, so there is now uh, a, a larger number. So let me refresh this once again. We should be able to see a little bit more CPU activity than we are seeing. Maybe we'll revisit it in a little bit later. So maybe I'll ask you, uh, let's do a, a little bit of a Q&A. But you will see uh, the result of all of the work that I just did. Let's, let me hit refresh here. Uh, as you can see, it's increasing a little bit. So there's a little bit of a lag uh, when, this, uh, when this data actually becomes available uh, into the console. Uh, uh, there you go. Yeah, so you can see the CPU utilization. So that is uh, the activity that I did on the browser. That's what's showing up. Uh, on, on the Kubernetes console. So a lot of the things that used to be only be available uh, through the app server uh, actually are now available through the Kubernetes cluster itself. So that's an important thing to uh, to know as well. So as you can see, um, you know, Kubernetes is also not that scary. It's a, uh, it's, it's a relatively easy thing um, to get a hold of. Uh, and it's a very, very easy to use a Java EE application uh, on uh, on Azure and Kubernetes as well. So let me stop presenting. So I have a little bit more time. Uh, let me take a, a little bit of time to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and then if you don't have any questions, then uh, I guess uh, we're all ready, set to go. Any questions? OK, there, there's one question Yeah. from Marcelo, it's possible to, to deploy this same deployment 
project in another DM DBMS besides PostgreSQL? If yes. so, which aspects are important to consider? Absolutely. So you can deploy whatever database you want on Azure. Uh, you, we have a number of choices available, so I'll show you the choices real quick. Oh, I stopped sharing my screen. Let me reshare my screen once again. Let me show you the, the choices. Uh, so if you go, you're presenting your screen. Hopefully, it's working. OK. So if you, if you go and uh, hit Create, uh, and you say Databases, OK, there's a bunch of them available on Azure. So there's SQL, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, Cosmos, whatever you want. Right, so uh, you can very easily make a modification to this application uh, to run whatever whatever database you want. It doesn't need to be just Postgres. Any other questions? Okay, one more um, from Vladimir. Uh, Quarkus provides a compilation to native applications. In your experience, were you able to make a performance comparison between the Java functions uh, in Azure and these native applications? OK, so uh, Quarkus, I, I like it a lot. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a nice, cool project, and it shows a lot of innovation uh, in that can happen in the Jakarta E space. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you, majority of our customers uh, are not yet adopting Quarkus. Uh, you know, they're mostly running on um, either Spring or uh, all, uh, like a, basically traditional Java E application servers. Uh, what I hear from my customers is that uh, usually they are running longer lived applications. Um, so majority of them are not using functions quite yet. They're not using serverless. Uh, majority of them are either using on virtual machines or they're uh, running their applications on Kubernetes. And these are uh, these are basically uh, longer lived applications, so they don't just go away immediately. They are they uh, they are started up and they stay up and running for a few weeks, a few months. You know, in some cases, some a number of years. So the main performance optimization that uh, Quarkus provides is around startup time. Uh, so startup time in a longer lived application doesn't actually matter that much. Uh, there's definitely a performance difference between startup times of these traditional applications, Spring Boot applications, and uh, Quarkus. And there's some difference in memory also. But again, in terms of memory, in a longer-lived application, memory is not an issue. Usually, these machines are pretty big machines, and they come with a lot of memory to begin with. So it's hardly unlikely that you're going to run out of memory. Where something like Quarkus really fits is in serverless or Azure Functions environments. So if you're doing that, and that's, your, that's the way you're developing your applications, uh, and you need a, a more complex application than just, a, just whatever you can do in uh, Azure Functions natively, which is just basically Java SE, uh, definitely something like Quarkus uh, is, is a good choice there. Uh, outside of that environment, I don't know. I'm not that convinced that Quarkus uh, really gives you that much of a benefit uh, compared to the paradigm shift that you need to do. Because in order to learn, do Quarkus, you need to learn a lot of things. You need to understand ahead of time compilation. All of your libraries need to be uh, Quarkus compliant. So there's a lot of limitations around uh, using something like Quarkus. So if you're not using in a serverless environment, I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that this is something you should really explore. OK, one more question um, from Victor. I liked a lot to the auto scale option. What do you what do I need to consider in my application and infrastructure to auto scale horizontally? OK, so uh, remember, nothing in life is free, right? So. Um, each time you scale up a, a, a Kubernetes cluster, you do pay more money, right? So ultimately, you are billed by uh, the amount of resources that you use. So uh, if you have the type of application where you know ahead of time how much hardware you need, it's better to do uh, static scaling. So in other, in, order, in other words, you say, I need three machines, and that's it. You know, That's all I need. Don't auto-scale me. Uh, whereas, uh, if you have the type of application where you really cannot determine ahead of time how much demand you will have, how much demand fluctuation you will have. For example, you are in retail. 
uh, and in retail, uh, it, you, there's a huge fluctuation. Or you work for a university and you don't know how many uh, students you're going to get in during admission. That's a use case for using the auto scale function because auto scale will basically downscale and upscale your your cluster infinitely. Uh, and you can you can also uh, auto scaling doesn't need to be on control. You can also put bounds on auto scaling as well. But at the end of the day, whenever you're doing auto scaling, you don't have as much control over how much resources you have, and at the end of the day, how much billing, how much you're going to get billed with, right? So you have to think about all of these considerations very carefully. Auto scaling, no doubt, it's a cool feature. Um, you have to be careful and understand when to use it and when not to use it. Any other questions? Uh, subscription for for, uh, for principiants, maybe, you know, in order to to learn to how to ad admin Azure uh, using their tools. I don't know. Uh, not quite sure, Julio. Could you repeat the question, please? What you're asking me? And you have a, a basic sub subscription in order to yeah. learn more about about Azure. Oh, OK. You can get a free subscription, one year, free one-year subscription. Um, you don't have to pay anything. You will need a credit card, though, in order to uh, get the free subscription. Uh, but uh, you know, you have a free, uh, basically, almost $150 per, per month subscription. Actually, if you look in my, my machine, um, and if you look at the account that I'm creating, right, you can see 138.78 uh, credit remaining. And if you look in my subscriptions, my own subscriptions. I'm actually using a free subscription called Visual Visual Studio Enterprise Edition, and it gives me basically the same thing uh, as what you can get for free uh, for one year. Basically, you get $150 uh, uh, of credit for free. Oh, thank you. Okay, uh, and the link is there, I by think... the way. If, if you look at my, if you look at my. Um, uh, repository, right? If you click here, it'll take you to how you can get a free account for for twelve months. So it's it's uh, there so in, you, in, the, in the GitHub. The, the the demo that you do you did. Pardon, Julio. We can test the demo that that you did. Absolutely, I recommend it. Yeah, you can you can uh, take a look at the GitHub account, uh, clone it. Um, you know, run the run the uh, workshop yourself. I expect it'll take you about six to eight hours um, to to do it end to end. Oh, okay, Reza. I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you 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 can be healthy <laughs> <laughs> with, with this pandemic. And thank you for all. Uh, I hope that we can have you uh, in next sessions. Uh, talking about another topics, maybe about Jakarta E9. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can also talk to you about uh, what is going on with Jakarta E8. But yeah, anytime. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure. Uh, again, keep it up, guys. Um, just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean anything. Uh, you are uh, in in good shape. Uh, you know, it's very good to see that you guys are doing this in in uh, South America. Um, keep it going. I encourage it. Okay, thank you, Reza. Okay, bye for now. Bye for now. Take care.